when the, not when the flash goes off, no. Hi, this is John Solari, your host of The Method Actor Speaks. And today I have a guest I've been after for so long. The wonderful, talented, beautiful movie star that we all come to love and want. Her name is Francine. What's your last name? Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> I, for a minute, I didn't think you were talking about me, but I, I guess you are. Uh, yes, it's Francine York, John. I am. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like you we, didn't know. <laughs> anyway, we really, and we have a few guests around here. I can't get around to saying hello to them yet. But Francine, I even really would like to know, why did you become an actor? Well, <clears throat> I came out of the womb and there was a flashing light and I did my first close-up. <laughs> you know the joke, you open the refrigerator and the light goes on and you do an act? Yeah. No, uh, I, well, when I was a child I would dance at, um, at weddings and uh, I charged I, for chewing gum or 10 cents, but now I'm much more expensive. Yeah. And um, my parents would have people over to entertain and I'd get up and I'd do different acts and do the hula. And, and I used to love the um, Rita Hayworth and her Arabian pictures. I ended up later working with George Cook Hard uh, doing a belly dance. And uh, at, at my um, all, all the birthday parties that I would go to, I would do French accents. I would sing L La Vie en Rose with a French accent. And of course, I couldn't speak French at the time. And later, I went to, to work with Jerry Lewis, and I did what they called fractured French, which I was doing when I was in, in grade school. But uh, my whole dream, my whole life, was just to be an actress. In high school, I did all the class plays and starred in them. And they wrote in my yearbook um, that we knew you were going to go to Hollywood. But how does a little girl from Minnesota, Minnesota, from a small town, way up in the north, iron country, get to Hollywood? That was the big question. And how did that, that's the big question. I, everybody <laughs> out there today wants to know, how did you get there? You know, sometimes you plant something in the universe. You, you say what you want. And sometimes the how sort of takes care of itself. I mean, I, I believe there was a lot of a lot of destiny involved. Uh, do, do you believe in destiny, John? Does sometimes think I'm sitting next to you, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't the stars. The name of my town was Aurora, like the Aurora Borealis, and um, it, it seemed like. The powers that be put me in this town and gave me these wonderful parents, which they're gone, makes me very sad. And um, my mother liked to dance and sing, and we used to sing in the car, and I used to polka with my father, which was one of his biggest joys. He was tall. He looked like John Wayne. My father was very handsome. And um, I think that they helped me a lot in, in that respect, because they had a lot of uh, joie de vivre, a lot of zest for life. And um, my teachers in school were very supporting. I used to sit out in the backyard and get sun at the time. I don't do it anymore. And read the movie magazines and, and see all the stars. And like Susie Parker was a beautiful model. And I wanted to be a model too, like Susie Parker. And um, Elaine Stewart, she was kind of one of my inspirations, if you remember yeah, Elaine. Sure, of course. Uh, and all these uh, you know, stars out here, Elizabeth Taylor, I remember I did a poodle haircut like hers. And, um, and this, this was the whole thing in, in, through, through life. I, I won all the contests in school, all the declamation contests. Now, you probably, you know what declamation is? Uh, sell it for the audience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can do it at, at kind of an oratory. And uh -huh. I would always pick a dramatic thing. Some people do something on politics. And I would do things like The Day That Was That Day by Amy Lowell, which was a, a two Southern women. Uh, one of them was Rachel and the other was uh, Minnie. And um, Rachel comes in one day and she sees that Minnie has taken some wood alcohol. And I dressed up in my grandma's old black coat, black shoes, and I put cornstarch in my hair. And when Rachel comes on, she sees Minnie has taken wood alcohol. Why, my child, what have you done? I've never said, well, I, don't, I can't believe you do something like this. What in the world inspired you to do this? I'm just so tired of everything day after day, Rachel. I make the same bed. I sing the same quilt that Dad's had here for now 30 years, wash the same old dishes. Life is just every day the same old thing. Well, that ain't no excuse for you to go take wood out the hall and take your life. Why, well, you're still a young child, and you're only 37 years old. Oh, I just feel like the oldest lady that ever was. I can't take life no more, no how, no way. Well, I want to tell you, Minnie Child, I'm very disappointed in you. You just put that down now. Everything's going to be fine. You wait and see. Anyway, that was part of it. So this happened to be, I won the declamation award, and I uh, went on to do the same 
a, a, a dramatic reading for the Miss Minnesota contest, which I was in when I was 17 years old. And B.B. Shop, <clears throat> excuse me, who was a Miss America of 1948, came up to me after and she said, Francine, I think you're going to be a star. And I, I was so encouraged by that. And many, many years later, when I was in San Francisco, I, we haven't quite gotten there in our talk yet, John, but yeah. I used the same reading and um, I got, uh, I was ended up being Miss San Francisco. What can I tell you? <laughs> but, um, and then I did the, the um, Our Town uh, from the Thornton Wilder play, yes. and, and I um, turned it, uh, wrote it myself, and I turned it into just a, um, uh, a one-person monologue. And uh, one of the lines in Our Town was so extraordinary, it, it's very much like today. Do any people realize life while they live it every single minute? Then she tells the manager, take me back up the hill to my grave. At that point, I had the audience in high school in the palm of my hand. <laughs> and then when I was a senior, um, I did a play called Room for One More. Now, John, does that title remind you of any movie that was ever done? It does, yeah. Room, uh, oh, I think, think Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. Okay, no, they no. did the movie approximately around those years where the, uh, the the father was called Poppy and they end up adopting a lot of children and I played the mother. Well, there was cornstarch back in my hair. <laughs> I was very big. We didn't have any wigs. So um, I, I had a soliloquy at the end of the play and I'm standing up there in front of the audience and delivering this line all about Poppy and the whole high school audience was in perfect silence. I have to tell you, John, the feeling, ah, it, it, you understand because you've done stage and things, when the, you know the audience is with you and, you and you're giving it your all, and the orchestra leader, Mr. Olson, was down there playing his violin while I was doing this, I said, this is what I have to do. Later he wrote in my yearbook, he said, when I did this, uh, played the violin and you did the soliloquy, I knew then that you had to go to Hollywood. Again, there I was, yearbook, everybody's writing in. All my teachers were encouraging me. Miss Lodgard, who was my English teacher, plus who put me in all the plays, we know you're going to go to Hollywood. Wow. Oh. 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 <laughs> I mean, there I was. Again, we have to know where this little town is. It's way up north. It's 100 miles south of the Canadian border. If you blink, you miss the main street. And at that time, every other place was a bar. And every, all the miners would come home from work and go in the bar. And in, in the young, young days, they didn't even have bar seats. They just had spittoons down there. And they go, ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody chawing tobacco, you know, that kind of thing. Ding, ding. Yeah. In fact, well, subsequently, years later out here, I bought a little one of these uh, spittoons. spittoons. And I put flowers in it just as a memory of that. But things were a little bit different. And things were very simple. You know, you go into a store and the cookies were all lined up in, in uh, little bins and everything. And, and, and we had uh, gold cash registers, none of this, this stuff of today. I mean, life was simple and kind of wonderful. And we used to play Monopoly and I played cards with my, my grandparents and my Uncle Charlie. And, and, and we did things together as a family. And, you know, today, um, it, Big difference. it isn't like that. And I, I'm so grateful that I came from that era. Um, I know where where milk comes from because my grandparents had cows, except I could never I could never get milk out of a cow. My uncle I, my uncle was in the in the barn one day, and I said, "Can I try?" And I try. I said, "Nothing's coming out." And he said, "You got to do it like this." And then he took and squirted at me. I still remind I have still one uncle left, and I remind him of that. He always chuckles. So I I took the cows to pasture, and I hoed potatoes on Grandpa's farm. And I loved going to the root house and smelling the earth there. I, I'm a product of the earth, and I think that's what's kept me stable in this town, you know, that where I come from. Right. Because I think your background and your parents and so forth. Anyway, I, um, I, I graduated <laughs> with honors, so to speak. And um, what was I going to do? I, I, didn't, I was offered a scholarship at Hamlin University for drama and journalism, but I was tired of school. I'm not a great person for regimentation. I don't like people to tell me what to do. <laughs> I can identify with that. You can identify with that. I know you can. And um, I kind of had it in school because some of the teachers weren't just the greatest. In fact, um, I'm going ahead of my story, but there's a little thing that happened later with those teachers that I'll tell you when I get to it. So then um, I, 
ended up going to an airline school. I thought, well, you know, maybe I can be an airline stewardess and get around and get out of town and get out of Dodge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so um, I uh, went to this airline school and it, it was, uh, all I learned was RSVNS and I went to work for Northwest Airlines and I just erased and looked at the clock and I got fired and then I cried. I thought I'm a failure. Daddy said, come home. Then I saw an ad in the newspaper saying, models wanted for sweaters. And so I thought, oh, today you never do that, John. You know that. No. You never answer an ad like that. Models want My God, it could be some weirdo out there. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, I answered the ad and I um, got the job. I got hired. There were a lot of things happened in the meantime, but I won't go through it. It's, it's, it's going to be in my book, by the way, that I'm still in the process of writing. It's getting closer. And uh, I will tell a lot of things, and I may never work in this town again, but it'll be great. <laughs> Walk around with a bag over my head or something. But anyway, so I traveled across the United States. I'm, I'm short shortening this job. But I uh, got to appear on television a lot and ended up in San Francisco. And um, there I um, started doing a, a lot of modeling and got in the San Francisco contest and sort of got discovered and uh, was... Um, well, in, in the sweater job, I did appear on a lot of TV shows around the country, so I got my first taste of what it was like to go on television. They would announce it in the paper that I was going to be appearing with the sweater. The sweater was unusual because you could wear it in a hundred different styles, and I would flip the collars and stand and do a spiel. You know what the spiel is, yeah? Spiel, okay, yes. a spiel. We're going to do a spiel. And uh, these heavy set ladies would come, and they they take the sweater home, and they come back, and they say, well, I didn't look like you in the sweater. <laughs> But um, anyway, I um, got the, then I uh, was in the San Francisco contest, got to San Francisco, um, was always in the newspaper, all the modeling. I had to model um, at Macy's. I, you had to do girdles and bras before you could do fashion. Really? Yeah, you love that, John. Yes. <laughs> so the day, of the, Miss, the day of the Miss San Francisco contest, what appears in the paper but a big, big, big picture of me with the bra and girdle, full page, holding a bra on each finger, ta -da! and I thought, oh my God, the very day of the San Francisco contest, there I was, I thought, is that going to hurt me? But it didn't hurt. So I, I got that. Then I was, as I said, top model, and, um, but I, I wanted Hollywood. I wanted, how was I going to get to Hollywood? I'm still in San Francisco, mind you. I've I got to I gotta get to Hollywood. So I um, saw an ad in the paper. <laughs> You know, there was that destiny again, whipping me up, I think. Uh, I call it in Spanish, el destino. There it was, you know, taking me to the next step. And so I got a job as a showgirl at Bimbo's. Bimbo's is a very, I think it, it still exists. It's not like it used to be, but all the stars would come through and they would perform there. We had, we had many, many stars, Sammy Davis and all these people. And I was sitting there, showgirls with the big hats and parading down, da, 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 pretty girl, you know, that sort of thing. And I did that for six months, and I met a singer there, Mary Meet French. And um, <laughs> one day she caught me in the, um, uh, in the um, shop, in the back room, where they kept all the props. And I had a broom in my hand, and I was singing to the broom, pretending it was a microphone. <laughs> she said, Francie, you had to be there. And I'm doing all of her acts of French. Um, entree de the pet place, big ollie, doing everything in French. And she thought, boy, this, is, this girl's going to try to steal my act, I know. <laughs> Of course, I couldn't sing pure French at that time. So anyway, she brought me down here, her manager, and uh, brought me down to California. And uh, there I was. I had, um, at the time, about four dresses and a, a wall and sock tape recorder. Uh, in San Francisco, I lived in a, in a one-bedroom uh, one place that overlooked a garage, which was hideous. And I swore I'd never do that again, and I haven't. And um, so um, from then on, it um, started with... Um, acting schools and uh, Jerry Lewis uh, kind of discovered me. I did six pictures with him. That's the, and, and people would like to know about that because <clears throat> as a comedian, Jerry Lewis was, you know, great, but he was also had an eye for the camera, the women, and everything, sound. He Jerry was really Lew a perfectionist. Jerry Lewis is one of the most talented, That's what incredibly I talented persons in, this, in, in show business. He. Uh, was the first one, you know, to invent the 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 uh, camera the, that you could watch. Um, the monitor. Monitor, thank you, yeah. Monitor, monitor. Like we're doing here. Yes, and he was the first one that uh, we would do a scene and we'd run to the monitor and see how the scene looked, and we couldn't believe this. This this had never been done before. And he collected, as his wife Patty wrote in her book, all kinds of 
instruments, machinery, I mean, tons and tons of stuff he had in his warehouse. Um, I remember when we were doing Nanny Professor, and he'd be giving us, he'd go, action, and he'd go into the scene, all of a sudden he'd be this character talking like this, you know, or like, and then he'd be playing Buddy Love, this smooth guy, and then he'd go into the character all of a sudden. I mean, uh, absolute genius. I mean, uh, I, he's finally starting to get some acclaim. They, I think they gave him a star on the walk, and they giving him some awards, and at last, I, I, I love the man. You know, we, we did six films. The last one was in 1982. And we hadn't seen each other for, well, actually, I'd seen him, let's see, I know I hadn't seen him since I did the ones in the 60s. And I was playing a French Marquise from the um, 15th century. And we had to go in this red coach. And um, the first thing Jerry said to me, it seems like we've sit and sat and talked like this before. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of funny. And yeah. uh, I had to speak fractured French. And when I went on the interview, Jerry bantered this entrain les jeux, qu'est-ce que c'est du bras? Entrain les and I can't better him back with this fracture. It's like you're not speaking French, you're just, right, yeah. you know. And he says, You got the job, you know. Gibbish. Yeah, we French call, we call it, we call it. Well, they loved it in France. I mean, they yeah. thought this was one of his best yeah. pictures because they subtitled it. They subtitled it in English. <laughs> so I'm in this coach and I'm driving down. We shot it on uh, uh, Coldwater Canyon at the. Uh, Department of Water Power had a place where they also shot Bonanza, and there's uh, ro roads and, and lakes and everything. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm in this red coach going along, and Jerry's my driver. It's a flashback in the movie. If any of you have seen the movie, it's called Cracking Up. And uh, it's a flashback where he's talking about his great great grandmother, who's a Nevish. You know, Kiska say Nevish, you know what a Nevish right, is, right? right. <laughs> okay. Nevish is someone who does everything wrong all the time. And he's a nebbish, and his grandfather was a nebbish. So we're driving along, and all of a sudden, the, um, I have to go to the bathroom. So I'm, I'm pounding, you know, I'm pounding, pounding, pounding on the on the coach. And uh, he stops the coach, and I go, "Je m'en vais qu'est-ce que c'est Oh, oh, and I said, and we're all on. And goes, he goes, "Wee oui, wee." Oui. I go, "Exactly." <laughs> so he builds me an outhouse. <laughs> and uh, the outhouse he's building, and then the horse whinnies, and I fly in the outhouse, smash into the outhouse. Then he gets put into, a la the, um, the Count of Monte Cristo, put into prison. Remember how that, right. and he escapes that way. Escapes. The, the picture was hysterical. I mean, uh, his writer, uh, uh, Richmond, I don't remember his first name, was one of the best writers. And I read the script, and I thought it was the funniest picture. Unfortunately, here I was with my Marie Antoinette outfit, 15th century, looking like, Marie Antoinette, and Orion goes bankrupt. <laughs> really? So the picture was big in Europe, didn't get a main release here, and there it is, but I've got great photos from it. But uh, previous to this, I skipped something. My first movie was Secret File Hollywood, and I had I'd done a play here which was called um, Whisper in God's Ear, ran for two years. It played a little, as they said, a shiksa in the picture. That's a long time out here, two yeah. years. Yeah, well, it was weekends, yeah. It ran, and then it they closed and then it reopened. It. George Boroff was the owner of the theater, and uh, he, is, he was married to um, Shelley Winter's sister, Alice. Oh. And uh, Shelley would, came backstage several times and uh, just say he liked the show, and and it, it was it was quite a quite a success. And um, it was my um, well, I had also done um, uh, 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 another play before that, so I mean I had done a few plays here. But um, I mean, see, that's a lot of things that people don't know that you did a lot of theater. Yeah, I did a lot of theater. Yeah. You know, I mean, you you know, in this town, you as a bombshell and beautiful, and they never took your talent. Well, they never, but you had dark hair. Yeah, dark hair. You were one of the few that could get away in Hollywood that wasn't a blonde. Well, you know, the Hollywood sunshine. I guess I made my hair blonde. I don't know. I've been redhead. I was a redhead for a while. Um, I don't know, maybe I'd work more as a brunette. Mm -hmm. I, I played Italian parts, I played French parts, I played belly dancers. See, people t uh, are getting to kind of know a little more about me on Facebook because they can see the various roles I played. Right. Uh, I didn't always, I didn't play sex bombs, uh, <laughs> for the most part. I mean, uh, uh, my Marilyn Monroe thing, which I did this um, movie, which was not as a picture, but... With John uh, Philip Law. With John Philip Law, but I think I captured Marilyn, I, I've been told, better than most people, I don't know, hopefully I did. And um, so every role that I get, I, I walk in the shoes, like when I was playing Italian parts, I would read the newspaper with an Italian accent. And of course my German thing, I, I talk with German, we're going to do this eventually, we're going to, you're going to be seeing this German uh, show, a little monologue thing I do. 
And uh, accents have always been, I was, since I was a child, because I was brought up with a lot of Europeans. Up in Minnesota, we had the Swedish people, and of course the uh, Yugoslavian, which is the middle Europe, the European accent that I also can do, the Russian and so forth. It's different, very different from, from the German accent, you know. So I do everything, anything you want. If I said, what do you want? I do it. What do you want? What can I tell you? So, um, but, um, I, I, you know, the, the, most directors, today don't have much imagination and, and they see a photo of casting people. Casting people. Casting that little tiny picture like this and they say, yeah, I know Francine, but well, they don't know me. That's why I've been going to some of these workshops so they can see the full picture. And mm -hmm. um, fortunately, unfortunately, I look much too young for my young age of 39. Well, isn't it also too <laughs> today, it's not, <clears throat> when you were in the business, it was a business that was run by artists, people who were interested in making films and talent, where today it's more, it's corporations. And so now they want, well, Francine's selling Europe. If she can sell in Europe, okay, we'll use it. We don't care if she has talent. They like her because, especially in France, okay, she did Jerry well, Lewis films. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, There's see, nothing to do today with a lot, talent. A lot of these uh, um, producers and casting people don't realize out there the, the tremendous fan base I have. I mean, I, I am shocked at the fan base. <laughs> it amazes me how many people know my work. And, and uh, it's rather gratifying and I appreciate it. And, but I want to continue working because I know that I have, you know, good years here. Well, and, but, but it's true though, the casting people are 12 years old today. Uh, I'm being very funny. Not all of them, but no, they no. don't have the imagination. Um, and they're so afraid of their jobs, they're afraid yeah. to bring certain people in, I think. And uh, uh, a lot of times, if they don't put you on film, you don't get even a chance to meet mm -hmm. the, the producers, who usually, when I work for them, they like me very much. I have never had a... In fact, many of them, uh, one, one director on for commercials hired me for six commercials. He had me playing an old, worn-out woman in the Northwest in a Quest commercial. I mean, who would imagine me playing this broken-down woman in the Northwest who was just walking around like this, can barely move, you know, looking horrible. And, uh, and then he had, I was doing like a Mae West thing when I worked with Bob Dylan in his, in his commercial. I mean, I played everything with this man, but he's, I don't think he's doing them anymore. So. Uh, Irwin Allen, for example, hired me for six projects. Irwin had an eye. He knew, and he liked to have this little repertoire company, as right. Jerry Lewis did. And he knew he could trust these people. Now, there isn't any of that today, although there is this, this kind of nepotism thing, or if... Um, nepotism, yes. You know, and so-and-so and -so has a friend, a star, and he puts his star friend in, and so well, forth. Not so much said that anymore. I mean, well, I, I remember I, the Actors Studio, yeah. and years ago, when you watched the film, you were talking about Shelley Winters. Yeah. <clears throat> You would see a bunch of members of the studio in that film. Today, that's well, they, 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 where they are can. They? They, you know, they, well, you know, I have to tell you a very funny story about Shelley Winters. I had done this picture in um, Spain with George Papard, which I played an exotic belly dancer, and I practiced the whole thing, and I went to the belly dance lessons, choreographed my whole thing. I mean, I saved them so much money in Spain, in Madrid, we shot this. Anyway. It was an optional nude scene, which was a, a, for the foreign version. Right. And um, I thought, sure, fine. I mean, everybody's doing it. So we come back, and we, there's a seminar, and Shelley Winters is the head of the seminar. And she's talking about, I think this nudity in films is abominable. I think it's <laughs> disgusting. I think well, we didn't have to do this in our day. I don't know why people do it. I hate it. But my dear, if I had your body, I would do it. <laughs> Swear to God, that's what she said to me. And I was with, I was dating Clint Walker at the time, and Clint and I were. I, 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 yeah. Oh, what a, what a gorgeous man he was. <laughs> oh, I dated the best. Let's face it. <laughs> you <laughs> did date when I was the good ones. <laughs> Never found a husband. You know what they say, that uh, glass slippers are not made in size 10, John. I mean, if I can true. find a size 10 glass slipper. Is there a size 10 glass slipper out there? I'm ready. <laughs> but anyway, um, so it, it's, been, it's been quite a, quite a career. Quite a, uh, they asked me, could I belly dance? I said, sure. You, you know, you don't turn down things. I mean, uh, if, but if they ask me if I can swim in something, that's uh, I will never go near the water. I almost died when I was nine years old. You can't get me near the water. Water is out, so folks, don't hire me for a movie where I have to swim. <laughs> well, one thing before this runs out of time, I wonder, you know, one of the reasons you were talking about Jerry Lewis, I just wanted to go back. Do you think one of the reasons why he was never recognized is because of the breakup of Dean Martin? No, I don't think Because so. Dean Martin became so popular. <sighs> I don't know if a lot of people uh, liked a lot of Jerry's so-called uh, shtick, maybe. And sometimes, um, I think that a lot of people thought that he had an attitude. Uh, Jerry came from a certain background and so forth. And I think that underneath all of that, there's a great deal of insecurity. And people who are insecure have to overdo and over, 
over ego eyes. That's my, my word I'm going. Yeah. And I think that's Jerry's thing, but I, 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 don't, I don't think that that's... There's a lot of... Uh, they used to say that he used to put his name stickers all over everything, all over the um, wherever he was. I mean, his ego was so big. That's what I heard. And yeah. yeah, and I think that ego comes from insecurity. But I know Jerry. Jerry's really a very good person. I I, I totally adore him. I went to see him in Damn Yankees and went backstage. First thing he did when he looked at me, he made the sign of the cross, like, "My God, I worked with you in '61, and here you are." <laughs> So, uh, in fact, I did a documentary on Jerry Lewis, and I said, you can have all your other comedians, whoever they are, they come out of the woodwork, but there's nobody will surpass Jerry Lewis, ever, 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 in, in, in my book. When they took him off the telephone, it oh, was like well, almost a, that a was, sacrilege. That was the worst thing, and I think it just broke his heart. I, I'm very, I bet you did. I'm very, very sorry for that, yes, John. You have any more last minute questions? Or is our time almost up? No, almost up, but I mean, no, we're gonna. I, there's a few other things. We, we're in Hollywood now, and uh, and, I don't, and maybe uh, what would you like? What do you see? What would you like to do right now? I would like to go to England and play something in Downton Abbey with an English accent. Or <laughs> I love those shows. I love them. I, I did get to do a hot in Cleveland. Uh, played a. Um, uh, yeah, British soap opera star. Unfortunately, they cut most of my role out, which I was, you know, you're always sub subjected to those cuts. <sighs> Even in Spain, they did that to me. One of my great scenes in that picture, they cut it out. I was so angry. I thought it's so male chauvinist to cut that scene out. Oh, I've had, I've had that happen. Well, actors are subjected to the, to the editing room, and that's unfortunate. Um, I would like to do a, 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 a Maybe a sitcom, a reoccurring role, um, a comedy is always good, or drama, I'm, I'm just as good in drama as I am comedy, you know, I've, I've been trained in everything, my, my background is, sometimes I'm too smart for the room, I go in on interviews and I, I think I sort of am a little much. Well, one of the compliments <laughs> that I think you received was from, uh, I think it was uh, Abby Reese, the casting director, who told you you belong at Actors Studio. Yes, right, yeah. Which is a... Uh, you know, I do too. I, I believe you belong there because you, you yeah. really, the talent you have. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm sitting here with Francine York and I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, this is unbelievable in the sense if you go back to all the movies and who you've been with and this and that. And here you're sitting in this, next to me, John Solari. I'm sitting I'm thinking, next to well, John. I mean, that's my thrill. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just uh, in amaze that uh, it's incredibly talented. And beautiful woman is sitting here next doing the method actor speaks. So on that note, we're going to end, and I want to do. We're going to come back, and you're going to see her little German. And I hope Rosebud and her friend Rosebud is here, and Robert, who's been done the show, will hopefully give some advice on how to do this. All right, my lovely. Thank you for coming. Well, thank oh, you. Oh, your website. Give them your website. Oh, www.francineyork.net. And if you want to order any of my films, and there's photos, you can uh, push contact, and you can leave me a message there, and I will get back to you. Uh, anything you'd like. She does get back, too. Uh, uh, if there aren't pictures that are on my site, um, you can ask and request different things. And I would like to meet you all on my site, www.francineyork.net. Well, they don't use a W anymore, so it's oh, just well, francineyork.net. Well, just francineyork.net. Just and Facebook. Cut off the w and I'm on Facebook. And I'm on, I'm on uh, Twitter, and I'm on LinkedIn. I don't even know how to use those things. <laughs> I go to all these uh, Academy events and take pictures with the stars. That's right, she's a I, member I, of the Academy. Yeah. So. Oh, yes, I, I, I'm real busy right now going out and seeing all these different shows. And then I put everything on Tweet with all the stars that I'm... I'm with, and it's fun. I love it. I love, I love, there's no business like show business. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's enough to give you a headache, but, you know, yeah. the ups and the downs and the arounds, but I tell you, I wouldn't be doing anything else. I, I, well, yeah. Francine, i got to say, you're a gift. You're a gift to us, and I want to thank you for being on the show. 